about how uh, in three classes um, and worksheets, there's going to be sort of a lot of isolated techniques and sort of formulas to remember. And sort of the whole point of the rest of the semester is going to be, at least in classes, when we're not talking about projects, um, is to try to capture these in some unified framework where we don't have to memorize so much, right? If you go and pull up Google and look for like trig identities, you'll see just like a million of them listed out. And our goal in mathematics is not to memorize, you know, a bunch of formulas. Like we want the the, the processes and so the processes that um, sort of govern and sort of the processes you could use to derive these things. And then sort of a few basic principles you can just derive everything from. So this is like a technique in math that goes back to uh, Greek era, like Euclid, um, you know, he sets up geometry with four or five axioms and then deduces all of these theorems about them. Um, and so like the core principles, the axioms are the important thing. And then the processes used to get all of the results are important. And like somehow just memorizing all of the results isn't, um, it's like not the end game. Um, yeah, so just with that being said, um, the stuff I'm going to be talking about talking about is going to be slightly different in terms of notation and phrasing than the stuff that you're looking at, you know, in the videos and free classes, but um, hopefully it helps tie it together. Uh, so yeah, today we'll talk a little bit about what's in those and then we'll talk about the project. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to say a little bit about something we have sort of already looked at. Some trig functions as, I guess, geometric ratios. Not rations, ratios. Um, so the idea here is that we, so we've chosen some coordinate system as usual. We have this like y hat direction. We have this x hat direction. The way I like to think of this um, is this is like a frame of reference. If you're doing, you know, something like physics, then you know it kind of depends on where you like what reference frame you're looking at. Um, so I could go out and draw this in chalk on the sidewalk, and I've just arbitrarily chosen here's a place to put the origin. Um, but the point is, is that you know we make this choice sort of arbitrarily, um, but all of the geometry we can do won't won't really depend on that choice. So we have a spot that we're just calling the origin O. Um, and let's just say we're given uh, some angle theta. And we remember that this determines a uh, ray until we, um, all right, so this thing starts at the origin, just shoots off to infinity. Um, and let's say we also choose a radius. If we've chosen a radius, then this, you know, normally this would just continue off otherwise, but we choose some radius r, then we get a well-defined honest point in the plane. And so this is kind of the idea behind polar coordinates that you can specify you know, something in the plane, like the plane is two dimensional, right? You have sort of two directions you've chosen, the x hat and the y hat. So somehow you need two pieces of information to tell you about where you are in the plane. How, how far are you along the x hat direction and how far are you along the y hat direction? Um, but it's also equally good if I just tell you, so that would be like an X and a Y. Um, it's also equally good if I tell you just start at the origin, turn in some direction and go X or go R many feet in that direction. Then you can still sort of get to that point. Um, and I want to point out the thing to sort of, there's sort of a picture to keep in mind here. I'll switch over to it. Um, this is kind of the thing just to convince you that every point in the plane can sort of be specified in this way. So here's sort of a, you have an, so you're in the X and the Y plane, but you're specifying an R and a theta. So it's kind of like you're standing at the origin, you're casting out a, a little ray in some direction, and then you're asking go R units along that ray. And I just want to convince you that it's plausible that you could hit every single point in the plane this way, because if you shrink R and grow R, you could make this sort of anything along that ray you want. And then if you vary theta, you can sweep out a little circle. You know, this is from zero to two pi. 
So you can hit everything there. And then if you just make the radius a little bit bigger, you can hit everything there. So you can kind of, it's not really a proof or anything like that, but you can hopefully convince yourself that you can get every point in the plane this way. Okay, so we get some point, call it P with the vector symbol on it because we're thinking of this kind of as an oriented, it's something that starts at the origin and goes to that point. We're just kind of arbitrarily making that choice. And this is getting into the idea that we're now thinking of these not as just points in the plane, but vectors, something as a, a you know, it's an arrow that sits in the plane, it has a magnitude, r, you know, a length, um, and it has a direction, theta. And maybe, well, theta, or this p really depends on theta, and it kind of depends on r as well. Just as we saw in that picture, if I vary p and theta, I get different actual points that it ends up on. Sorry, if I vary theta and r. Uh, so the point here is that we can sort of do a natural geometric operation here. We can drop a perpendicular line to the x-axis. It's just forming a right triangle there. Um, and we can think we can, we can take this angle and we can think about an adjacent side. We can think about an opposite side and a hypotenuse, so formed by this triangle. Um, this is hopefully familiar, nothing too new here, um, but the, the new piece of information is that if I give you a point uh, in the plane or in polar coordinates, and I don't specify anything else, you can always just extract a natural triangle out of it in this way. And so you can think of things like sine of theta, so yeah, so right here, sine of theta, in this case will always be opposite over hypotenuse, cosine of theta, it's the adjacent over the hypotenuse, tangent of theta, I guess this one is, so it's uh, sine over cosine, so the h's cancel and you get o over a. This is for those that haven't seen it before, there's this like Sokotoa thing to uh, help remember these. And then if you do, there's all these um, co things, there's, so it's always hard to remember which one goes with which. So I think it's cosecant goes with sine. Secant goes with cosine. And cotangent just matches up directly. And the way you remember these is you just take, I guess this is an important um, thing I'm leaving out here. Um, so there's kind of a warning. The thing to remember here, it's going to be pretty important later, is that there's this symbol kind of floating around. this uh, sine inverse. And so I'll tell you what that's actually defined to be. It's defined to be this arc sine function of theta. So this is a place where notation can be kind of confusing because um, we use this to the negative one power to indicate taking a reciprocal or like exponentiating something. For trig functions, and specifically for trig functions, um, this notation indicates like an inverse function. So we have maybe talked a little bit about a lot of different types of inverses. You can have inverses that are like multiplicative inverses where you multiply them together and they cancel. And that's like a reciprocal. Um, you can have functional inverses, which we kind of looked at in, I guess, unit two, right? Um, where you kind of compose them together and they cancel. It's like exponential and log or functional inverses. Um, but these are generally two different two different things. Um, and so what I will write um, in general, like if I'm doing something like, I'll just say here, the sine inverse of theta is not equal to one over the sine of theta. And so this is a big caveat. 
And how might you remember this? Well, the only reason we kind of get away with this kind of weird notation is that we already have a name for one over sign of theta, which is cosecant, right? It's literally just this thing here. And so that's that's at least one way to remember remember that. And so I'll just move this over a little bit. Okay, and then similarly, this, this guy is one over cosine of theta. And if you want, this is one over tangent of theta. And so, you know, to get these these ratios, you're just flipping the the orders that you see on the left hand side. Taking reciprocals to be more precise. Okay, and then for these, if you want, there's another sort of mnemonic device. And I don't know how you would even begin to pronounce this, me cho sha cow ko something like that. Um, uh, just something silly to help you remember like which which order you need to take these ratios. Okay. And the, the point is here is that you can actually do this um, with any point in the plane you can ask about, um, at least geometrically. This is something that sort of scales out with the triangle. So like we are restricted to the unit circle necessarily if we know all of the sides of this triangle. So like if we knew this P bar point in terms of X and Y coordinates, then we could figure out what these side lengths are. And we could just take these ratios and that'll give us a way to compute sine of theta. Um, but right, if we, if we just know theta, this is going to be a little bit of a problem. So this is kind of, so problem is that just having theta isn't enough. This really is kind of an important idea that this, this theta is only determining a ray. So we can't really make one, I'm just kind of going back up to this picture here. We can't really make one triangle to try and take these ratios. Um, so you have to sort of pick, um, you know, like a convention to go with, like pick one triangle. If you want to just define, so I guess this is the problem of given you know, theta, what is, say, just sine of theta. And so the way you solve this problem is that if you're just given the angle, you pick a special um, radius, just a radius of one. And so you end up with a picture, see something like this. This is supposed to be kind of an analog of the picture up there. So you have a Y hat, you have an X hat. This thing is now the unit circle. This is a radius of one. You just remember that if you pick some theta and you cast a ray out to infinity like that. Then all I'm saying is that, well, you didn't choose an R, but you can choose a very special R, like R equals one. And you can ask about this point where it intersects. This is like a totally geometric way to define what the sign of an angle is if we don't know things like side lengths, we don't have a triangle lying around. So we know that this will be some P bar depending on theta, but we've kind of picked a special r equals one. And through some geometric principles, this will be in x, y coordinates, cosine of theta and sine of theta. And really I could have, sorry, keep scrolling back and forth. 
Um, but if I go back up to this picture here, I could have also noted that in polar coordinates, this is given in the x coordinate. It really is r cosine of theta and r sine of theta. And so this is really just a special case where we've taken r equals 1. and try and like fit this all in there if I can. Okay. So in, in this, this is essentially how you would define sine of theta or cosine of theta. Cast your ray at that, that angle, go out and look for where it intersects the unit circle. Um, and then just take the x and y coordinates of that thing. Okay, so I want to do maybe a slightly bigger version of this picture. So we can talk about the components of this thing. I don't know, maybe let me do this. Let's kind of zoom in on like just this part here. And look at this, this situation. So we have something like this. And we were intersecting some uh, unit circle at this point. All right, so this is literally just taking that, that picture above and we're just kind of zooming in on the first quadrant. We still have this angle theta, we still have this direction y hat, and this direction x hat, and this p bar. Actually, let's, let's do it this way. Let's say that you're, let's say that this thing is the unit circle. And this thing is just an arbitrary circle of radius r. So right, we have this this ray determined by theta, and it you know keeps going off to infinity. And we know that in polar coordinates, this thing is given by, let's call this p bar zero and this p bar one. This one was just cosine of theta, sine of theta. And this one is kind of a scaled up version of that, r cosine theta, r sine of theta. And let me shrink these down a little bit so we have some room to work. No, that didn't go well. Okay. So what I want to ask at this point, so if I have polar coordinates for a point, um, maybe off to the side here. <clears throat> oh, so recall that we have this there is an addition for vectors. So anytime I have two of these vectors, the, the way to kind of remember it is tail to tip. So these are purely geometric objects in the plane and I'm just defining something I'm calling addition. So it's some weird operation. Um, it's nothing like addition for real numbers. We're now adding two geometric objects, um, but there are good, good reasons to, you know, it shares enough properties of addition that it's useful to call it that. And the way it works is that if you have 
one arrow like this and another arrow like that. And this I'm not going to be able to record in the notes. So I have to just kind of uh, do it in real time here. The way you add these things is you just, right, and so you're in some coordinate system you've chosen. Um, these are just two random arrows. They could be anywhere sitting around in, in space. You can kind of pick one up, the one you want to add. You move it so the tail of this arrow is at the tip of that arrow. And the resulting arrow you get starts at the bottom of the first one and ends at the top of the second one. So if this was A and this was B, then the thing in red is the thing we're just calling A plus B. That's just an aside. So what we want to do here is kind of reverse this process. We're given some arbitrary vector, and we want to break it into components. And we'll see that this comes up in the project. Um, uh, well, probably I won't say too much about it now, but if you're thinking about um, things coming from physics, um, you know, maybe if you're working against gravity or something, then you're moving in some, some vector, some direction in three-dimensional space now. And somehow, um, you know, only the force that's pointing straight down really matters. Um, so somehow you have a vector, but you want to decompose it into like which part of the vector is pointing down, which part of the vector is pointing sideways, um, that kind of thing. So that way you can, you know, determine which ones influence like a calculation you're doing and which ones are kind of uh, orthogonal to it and not contributing. So in the project, we'll see this because you'll have this leaf pointing up, you'll have a light ray coming in at some angle, but kind of the only contribution of the light ray to the energy going into the leaf is the contribution that's going straight down. So you decompose this light ray coming in at some angle into like a proportion that's coming in straight down and a proportion that's coming in sideways. So this may not make too much sense now, but hopefully it will as, as you spend more time with the project. So the way, what I want to do with um, with this vector here is decompose it into two things. I want to decompose it into kind of one piece along the x hat direction and one piece along the y hat direction. So in other words, I want to use this kind of vector addition law that I have to get some vector down here. And okay, there's not great notation for this. So let's call, so this P bar was actually the point out there. Let's call V bar, this vector starting at the origin and ending at that point. So we can kind of go back and forth and ident identify one and the other, but they're kind of two different things really. One of them is just a point in the plane, but we know we can always just get a vector from it by connecting the origin to it. So we have some vector V we want to get some component v, you know, just put v sub x. So this is just like, what is the horizontal component of this? If I want to get to that point, how far, you know, east do I have to go if I'm just walking directly east? Um, and I want to get a vertical component like this. This would be something pointing that way. Think of this as like a v bar sub y, so some vertical component that gets me to that. And the name of the game is going to be that I want v bar as vectors. We're, we're now thinking of this like vector addition law to be v bar in the x direction plus v bar to the y, direct, y direction. So the x component or the y component of this vector. Um, and right, and this is this is just coming from the geometric picture. I noticed that if I add the red and the blue and do the tail to tip thing, I start at the the, the origin is kind of the, the entry point of the first vector. I follow it along, I go all the way up to the end of the second vector, and I end up at the point I want. So this is satisfied by these uh, geometrically. And the question is how do you actually get 
formulas for these things. And actually it ends up being not too difficult. Really this idea of polar coordinates uh, does a lot of work for us. It's really the most, most useful concept to, to know here. So there's actually a way we can just write down v bar of x. Okay, so a vector, right, it has to be something that starts at the origin here. We want it to end at this point here. So really this is just saying, okay, it's what point are we going to end at? Well, we aren't going to go any, um, we're not going to travel any distance in the y direction. We're just going to stay completely level. And how far out are we going to go? Well, we're just going to go out exactly r cosine of theta um, units. Or in other words, if you like, this p bar was just equal to some point x, y. And so this point down here is just x, zero. And so that's, that's all we're really doing is we're just picking off the, the x component of this vector. V bar y. So fortunately, a similar formula works, but it's harder to kind of see why. So the idea is, well, now we're starting at this x, x zero point down here, and we want to get to the point that we want eventually. So what do I need to add to it? Well, I don't want to travel any more in the horizontal direction, but I need to travel some, some units of y vertically. And so I just need to go r sine of theta units um, up. And this is a little bit confusing, um, I think, because this point, you know, it's not zero r sine of theta, it's r cosine of theta, r sine of theta. So like, how does this v sub y here correspond to this v sub y we had? And the kind of magic of vectors, sorry, my cat's in the way. Um, the magic of vectors is that we have this, um, in physics, you might call it like a superposition principle where you can kind of move them around freely. So a vector is determined by its magnitude and its direction, but it doesn't really matter where you kind of place the, the base of the vector, which means that we can kind of pick this whole thing up, vy, make a copy of it, and I can just move this around the plane freely and it's still the same, same vector. So one thing I can freely do is move it to a very nice place like the origin, and this is liter literally the same vector. So this is a little bit tricky, right? Because it's not it's not actually the same um, line segment at all, right? They start and end at two totally different places. Um, but in this this framework of vectors, we're allowed this freedom to kind of translate these vectors all around. And what happens here is that it's actually this point is zero r sine of theta. Or if you want, just zero y, whereas this thing was x zero. And so you can kind of trace this over. And even if you want, sorry, this diagram is going to get pretty busy in a second, but you could also just move this up here, get a copy of that vector. All right, so up there. So I have kind of two paths of getting to this point. One of them was more useful to figure out the x-coordinate. One of them was more useful to figure out the y-coordinate. But you can see just geometrically, if I add both of those vectors, it kind of doesn't matter which, which one I, I do. If I go around the bottom part of the square, I'm still ending up at my destination. I go through the top part of the square, I'm ending up there too. And that's just following the this like vector addition law. OK. so. And I will post these notes up later for whatever, um, you know, so you can use them as, as a reference if you need. Um, but what I want to say here is like the, the takeaway from this is 
that we can break vectors up into components. This is a technical term. And the, the kind of heuristic or the slogan you want to keep in mind, slogan is cosine kind of looks like the x component. You can also think of this as like a direction if you want, in which case this would be an x hat. Sign kind of corresponds to the y component. Okay. And we'll just say one sort of nice thing that falls out of this really nice uh, or sort of really easily. Uh, just do a quick sketch for this one. Here we're just going to be on the unit circle. Here are our directions. Y hat, X hat. So I'm drawing this kind of picture a lot because for a lot of these problems, this is you know the picture you want to draw. Um, you just think about casting a ray, some angle theta. Let's ask ourselves, this is R equals one. Um, if we go to this point, and so polar coordinates is telling us sort of, sorry, cosine corresponds to the X component. Sine corresponds to the Y component. And R is just one. So those are literally cosine and sine. Um, and so this, the length of this vector here is R. And so one really nice thing that comes out of this is that um, if you just do drop this perpendicular, make this triangle, you have a right triangle here where the length of this, or let me just do it this way. So there's an A, there's an O, and an H. So these are just lengths of those sides. The length of A from that previous discussion is just the X component of this vector. So it really just is cosine of theta. Okay, and the length of that vertical component is the sine of theta. And we know, fortunately, Pythagoras did a lot of work for us. That O squared plus A squared equals H squared. And I guess we also know that H is equal to R is equal to one in this case. So one nice thing we can conclude here is that, well, I have another name for O, it's cosine of theta squared plus, oh, sorry, I guess I put these in the wrong order. So that's, that's A. Um, and then here I have sine of theta. And I square that whole quantity. It's equal to h squared, which was just one. And I mean, it's a, in the notation you've probably seen, we put the two on the cosine squared of theta, which is equal to one. And so this is like the fundamental uh, trig identity. And so this just comes out of, so this is like some combination of the Pythagorean theorem and the fact that um, if you're on the unit circle and you just take the polar coordinates of your points, the X component and the Y component literally just are cosine theta and sine of theta. And then uh, I just wanted to point out something here too, just kind of be careful about uh, these two notations. Uh, maybe I just put a warning over here. Uh, 
just to remember that, well, maybe this is the one to be more concerned about. If you have this two over the cosine there, um, it's a little bit confusing because this is like also where we put the negative one when we're indicating, um, you know, like the functional inverse. So you can't really, uh, these, these mean two totally different things. So the way I would get around that is just try to try to use Try to use this um, notation if you can. So cosine of theta. So number one is that theta is always a function. So use uh, parens to, to close the argument up. So you know like what are you actually taking cosine of. And then two is just put the whole thing in parens and just say, say exactly what you're squaring. Um, this kind of gets rid of any ambigu ambiguity about what could possibly be happening versus something like cosine of squared of theta or something like that. So that's not, not great notation. Because it's not clear, like, if you had other stuff coming after this, like plus three, are you taking cosine of theta and then adding three? Are you taking cosine of theta plus three? Yeah, so you definitely use those and stick with these notations of um, arc sine versus sine inverse. I think this is just an easier way to way to go. Um, just so that way there's no ambiguity at all. You can sort of just put an arc in front of it and the arc is just indicating it is the inverse function of whatever you're you're asking. So you could do, you know, arc tan, the arc tangent, arc cosecant, you know, kind of anything you want. Uh, but the arc is a little bit nicer than the, the negative one. Okay, yikes. Yeah, we got to say something about the project. So Let me pull up where, see how far we got last time. Uh, maybe it is helpful first to look at some pictures. So let me just pull those in. Rather than be drawing these, I found some nicer diagrams online that kind of say what's going on a little bit nicer. Um, so, right, if you remember, the sort of premise of this project is um, actually maybe maybe it's even better to see. Uh, I have a different visualization first. This thing is probably the one I want. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, the setup for it was that, okay, we're thinking about the sun orbiting the Earth. You know, maybe the Earth, maybe this is the sphere here that uh, we're on. And we're thinking about a little point on the Earth and a little leaf. And we're trying to ask questions about how much energy, so like leaves photosynthesize, they convert light energy into chemical energy. And we want to ask some questions about like how much energy are they absorbing if we somehow know the energy output of the sun? And so this is kind of a geometric problem because it depends on a lot of things, like namely the angle that sort of the rays are coming in from the sun and hitting the leaf, and also kind of what angle is the leaf at. It'll depend on some other factors, like what is the area of this leaf? Um, what is, so I guess we're calling it, we're going to call it the energy density output of the sun. So it's going to be some number of, um, like some wattage is how we'll measure power, um, but it would be wattage per centimeter squared. So like some, this is a, you know, a density. And so that way we can scale it up by the area. And so this is kind of the situation we'll have is that we know that there's a, a periodic nature to the orbit of the sun, um, or even just, I guess, sorry, there's a periodic nature to the orbit of the earth around the sun. So I guess this picture is a little bit backwards um, for this visualization anyways. Um, but we know that, say, if I'm just fixing myself to be, you know, this point on the sphere, um, just because of the way that this rotation is happening, 
I'm going to go from light to dark and then back to light. And it's going to follow some kind of periodic pattern where the period will be 24 hours, right? As the, the Earth just spins. And so you can imagine, you know, if you're just looking at this little square of light being bounced off of the sphere here, this is the brightness of that square is indicating somehow the, the amount of energy hitting that spot. You know, if a lot of it is reflecting off and the reflection is going to be really bright. And this is exactly the same thing as, you know, a little leaf, you know, absorbing a lot of energy. We're just displaying it as a reflection here. And so you can see that kind of as the, you know, if the sun's kind of way off at an angle, um, you're getting kind of less light. If the sun's like directly pointing towards it, then you're getting a lot of light. And if the sun's, you know, somewhere off behind it, then there's no light at all to bounce. Okay, so we're gonna try and simplify that situation and analyze a little bit about what's going on. So the way we'll, we'll model it is that we'll take this light source to be the sun. We'll consider, let's draw it in orange, this point here. This will be our leaf. We're going to model, model our leaf as like a little um, plane. Or really, if we're looking at it from the side, just a little line. And this is kind of the geometric setup we have, is that this uh, L is indicating, well, it's a little bit weird because the light is coming into it, but we can sort of indicate it as a vector in either direction, just kind of flipping the direction. Um, so it's kind of more convenient in this picture to make it point out back towards the sun. Um, and we, we're going to have a leaf with some orientation to it, and that's kind of determined by this N. This N just always sticks out of the plane of the leaf. So if you kind of tilt the leaf a little bit, this N tilts in some direction. Um, and we don't have to worry about these two. This is more for a reflection and that kind of thing, which we don't have to worry about here. But what we're most concerned about is this angle here. Um, you can call it theta 1 and this angle here, theta 2. Sorry, I think I labeled these backwards in my notes. So let me just call this one one and this one two. Put a one there, two there. Okay, so theta one is measuring, it's kind of like forget about the leaf entirely. Just kind of fix the plane that the leaf is on and ask yourself, where is the sun along its orbit? Like what, um, what angle is it making with the ground? So that's going to be one piece of this puzzle. Um, just like what angle is the light source at from your measuring uh, place. Theta 2 is kind of the one we're ultimately after because this is going to determine how much energy is absorbed. The idea being that if, if Theta 2 was equal to zero, then this light vector and the way the leaf is pointing would be totally aligned. And this would essentially mean that the, like it's like 12 noon or something, the, the sun is directly above your head. All of the uh, light rays are kind of hitting uh, the leaf in a maximal way, um, and it's absorbing most energy. Whereas if you kind of tilt it off to the side, the light source is kind of way down off to the left, and all of these rays are coming in parallel, and like none of them are hitting the leaf, the light's absorbing no energy. So both of these uh, will sort of matter for us here. And what's what's happening here? Let's see if I have a good way. Yeah, so I guess I'll just draw this. The idea is we have this little plane that the leaf is on. It has this kind of normal vector sticking out. And we're, we're thinking about this in a very simplified way by kind of rotating this and just looking at it from the side as so this is just one simplification. Like this was the leaf, or at least like one tiny little square on the leaf. And this was our vector n, like that. And before we had some light ray coming in, sort of like that, really a bunch of them, um, but we'll kind of move them all so they're coming in at the same direction. And the way we'll simplify here is 
Let me just put it from this side so it's a little bit easier to reconcile with our previous drawings. So it's just whatever, um, let's see what we call this L. Oh, sorry, I realize the coloring is not matching up so well here. Okay, but you can't see that. Okay, green, green will be L for us. Um, so the way we will simplify this is that We'll just flip the direction of this like that. And we have this, as we call this bottom one, theta one, this top one, theta two. And actually, I think I want to make this slightly uh, bigger. The sort of key principle that we'll be using is that once we kind of fix the coordinate system, now we're kind of in a two-dimensional world, so we can fix an X hat and a Y hat. And we'll pick an origin, namely to be this point here. So this is kind of like we're now setting up a little reference frame. This is where our leaf was sitting at the origin. And we had some vector coming out like this. This is our light vector. And we had, uh, sorry, let me do it in a different color. So now that the, the end vector, so kind of the orientation of our leaf is pointing straight up, so it's kind of lined up with the uh, y direction for us. Sorry, I just want to make this uh, a little bit smaller. Okay, and there's our theta one. Here's our theta two. Okay, the the first principle that's going to be important here is that there's going to be an energy density. Um, well, maybe I'll just say what it is first and then I'll explain with the picture why it should vary. Um, so this energy density is actually going to depend on this light vector. So it's like a function that takes in the light vector. And I'm not gonna say what the actual formula is, I'm just telling you some proportionality relationship between them. And what is it proportional to? I'm going to use some kind of weird notation, but I'll explain what it means. Um, okay, so L sub Y is when we do this decomposition into two pieces. We get one vector like this, which is an L sub X. And we get one vector this, which is an L sub uh, Y. Okay, so we've broken it down into what is the horizontal component, the yeah, L sub X, and what is the vertical component, L sub Y. And L sub Y is the component that's kind of lining up with the leaf because we've chosen the coordinate system that way. And with this kind of funny two bracket, um, two lines on the end, um, this is saying the magnitude of that vector or the, the norm of that vector. Or if you want to think of it as just the length, that's totally fine. Um, but it's saying that as this, um, so this, this green vector L, right? This is the light vector sitting at the origin now. And now you're imagining this vector over time. This is essentially pointing to where the sun's coming from. So it's going to start at zero and it's going to just kind of run through a rotation, right? Of just like zero to pi. And then it's going to you know, be on the other side of the planet or whatever, and you're not going to see it. And then eventually, at the next day, 24 hours later, it's going to start that again. It's going to be at zero and then, sorry, start rotating through this again. So the, the thing to keep in mind is that if you're completely horizontal, then this L sub Y that you're seeing is not going to appear. Or rather, it's going to be like a vector with like zero. If you're 
kind of way down here early in the morning, then this vector is really short, all right? And if you're up here in the middle, then the little vector has some like moderate length. If you're at like uh, 12 noon or something, pointing straight up, then this vector is probably as long as it can be. Again, we're just looking at the L sub Y component of it. Um, so in other words, like the height of this, this point over time, kind of imagine that this point travels along a little circle and it kind of gets to a maximum height at noon and then kind of keeps traveling you know, as, as the day varies. And so the principle here is that the, um, this energy density is going to vary. And I should tell you kind of what the energy density means. This is kind of hard to deduce from the handout. So I have a picture for that, hopefully. This is something I pulled from a tutorial online. Um, so yeah, the star here is supposed to be the sun. The, the blue thing is supposed to be our leaf. The red thing is the, the orientation of the leaf, the normal vector pointing out of it. Um, and what's happening here is like in the top picture, you can see that as these things are lined up, you have a light is kind of like, it's coming out in a ray. And you wanna ask yourself, like this is just some fixed ray um, with some like fixed amount of energy. And so what's happening is that ray is like hitting a smaller spot with the same amount of energy in the first picture versus the second picture, you have the same amount of energy, but it's kind of spread out over a bigger area because you're at this angle and you can see kind of how this ray is intersecting your, your little square. Um, so this is like small area versus bigger area. And these two are just like some fixed um, amount of energy. And so all, all I'm really saying with this proportionality relationship above is that whatever this energy density is, it's going to have to depend on the component of this vector that's that's lying perpendicular to the sun. Or in other words, like, where are you on this picture? Like, is it is this vector completely lined up with the direction of the sun? So you can imagine that there's, um, let's see, I guess we've done it in green here. There's like a green vector coming directly down out of the middle of this. And in the first case, these vectors are like directly lined up. And so that's saying that like the y component is maximal. In the second case, they're kind of askew. So like the y component is somewhat less. And then, like I said, if you go off to um, an angle of, I guess, pi or something like that, it's, it's not hitting it at all. Okay, so the thing to remember here is like only the y component Uh, contributes. And so the first goal is going to be um, find a function, maybe find functions for uh, the norm of L sub Y. And maybe what it'll be. So we looked at this picture, we had theta one and theta two. And I think what you maybe want, will want to do is start with first finding F of theta sub one equals dot 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 something. G of theta sub two equals something. And what do I mean by this? I mean that you have to kind of go back to the geometry of this picture um, and ask yourself, if I'm given this light vector, and let's say I'm given this theta sub one, how do I compute the length here? So I claim that you have enough in just what we've talked about today to actually figure this out. Now it's just that it's a little abstract, so you have to kind of spend some time um, you know, thinking about vectors, maybe reading up a little bit 
about them on Wikipedia and kind of getting used to working with them. Um, but maybe I'll just show you what it is for theta one and I'll leave it to you guys to figure out how to get a similar formula for theta two. Right, because eventually what we, this is kind of the, the goal that we really want is we really want a formula for this energy density. Um, but we can start off by just making it a, form, a formula involving the angle. Okay, so I'll show it for theta one. So we'll need to carry around this picture. This is really important in this kind of analysis. Like we always, always need a, a reference picture for this kind of thing. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll simplify this picture a little bit because I'm just thinking about theta sub one. Make something large. And in this case, I have something like that. I have a y hat direction and an x hat direction. And let's just say, like we're not even in the case of above, let's just say we're, well, might as well just do it. So you have this, this vector L bar, and we want to find what is this decomposition? Um, what is the, the L bar sub x? Well, what we can do is we can write this in polar coordinates just like above. R cosine, I'm sorry, I forgot to mark, this was theta one. R cosine of theta one, R sine of theta one. Again, the key key thing to remember here is that cosines kind of correspond to X's, Y's correspond to uh, sines. And what we'll do is you can actually, there's an important assumption here. We can assume r equals one. The reason we can do this is because later on, so right now we just kind of want a direction that it points, and later on we can multiply in um, to kind of scale it up to whatever we need. So as long as we have a direction, then um, uh, we're kind of in business. So there's some vector like this. And there's nothing too crazy here happening, I promise, but this is definitely a definite uh, derivation you'll want to sort of explain a little bit in the project. This is exactly what we did before. We decomposed it into an x and a y direction. This is some v bar, or sorry, I guess we're calling it L, um, L sub x. And then in blue, L sub y. And I know that if L bar is equal to R cosine of theta one, R sine theta one, well, guess what? I can just copy this. Since we have one minute left here, try to speed through the rest of this. And if we want to take the X component, well, delete the Y component. We only want to go in the x direction. If we want to take the y component, well, delete the x one. We only want to go in the y direction. And so this is the one that we want here. And now you just need to know one other thing that if we have v bar is equal to a point x, y, then this norm of v bar. Well, it's really just exactly the Pythagorean theorem for this thing. That's all the norm really is, just kind of fancy notation for it. And what it is, let me just draw a picture here. So if you have some vector v bar, then this length is norm of v. And so the way you compute this length 
is you take x squared plus y squared and you take the square root. Just because if this was x, y, then this would be a length of x and this would be a length of y. So nothing too, nothing too fancy there. And so if you want to take the, the norm of this ly, well, I just need to take the square root of something. What is the something? I need to take the square root of 0 squared plus, I guess I can go back. We, we made this nice assumption that r was equal to 1. So we can delete all of these r's. And that's sine of theta squared. And now lucky for us, it simplifies to something really nice. It's just the sine of theta. And so the conclusion is that this energy density, which depended on, uh, in this case, the light vector, is proportional to, I'm sorry, this is sine of theta 1 everywhere, sine of theta 1, where again, theta 1 was this angle that the light vector made with the ground. So there's still some analysis you have to do with how does that depend on this other angle, theta 2? And I claim that you can just use some, some trigonometry stuff from class to relate these. Um, but that's what you want to start looking at, trying to derive these formulas. And I think that's pretty much it for today. All right.